You may remember that in our January meeting I mentioned uh, Charles Kingsford Smith having an accident on the Esplanade at Perth and how the accident was covered up. <coughs> um, I've done a little bit of research on the man and uh, he had a lot of accidents before <laughs> he got to that particular spot. So we might just backtrack in history a little bit. Um, he fought at Gallipoli and then on the Western Front as a dispatch rider. A uh, pretty dangerous sort of a job. He transferred to the Royal Flying Corps in 1917, um, early uh, February, March. In fact, <clears throat> he had his first flying lesson a hundred years ago this week. He went solo in four hours and 50 minutes, which was a very good move for those days. With 46 hours in his logbook, he was posted to active duty in France. Um, think back to your time and when you had 46 hours in your logbook and how good you were. I wouldn't want to be running up to an angry German, that's for sure. Um, he was badly injured in August 1917 and repatriated to England. His aircraft had 108 bullet holes in it. One of them went through his foot and badly damaged it um, and he lost a couple of toes uh, because of it. He was presented with a military cross by King George V at Buckingham Palace, which would have been a highlight, but unfortunately um, he was suffering from combat, combat neurosis and uh, in modern day language in the army that's called, what is it, uh, shell shock. Um, so he was deemed unfit for flying and he really had 12 months out of the cockpit. Towards the end of World War I he was directed to become a uh, flying instructor. He found it repetitive and boring and didn't like it and uh, he didn't succeed at that and then the war finished. He decided to become a barn barnstormer. <clears throat> he teamed up with a bloke called Cyril, another Australian, Cyril Maddox. Cyril worked in disposals of aircraft and some dreadful mistakes were made. Kingsford Smith ordered some wrecked aircraft and paid a, a song for them and he got delivered a perfectly good aeroplane. So he thought that with the help of Maddox he could repeat it again and again. So he did. He became noted for his reckless approach to flying and he also had a passion for pranks both in the air and on the ground. He insured his aircraft and was quite happy about writing them off because he paid a song for them and was getting full dollar when he wrote them off. So it was a means of making money. He was noted for his recklessness and his uninhibited carousing. Uh, this meant that he went to the pubs at every opportunity and uh, <clears throat> had a good time as often as he could. His name got around <clears throat> and he wasn't a very popular character because of his uh, smashing of aeroplanes in the insurance business who was trying to get onto its feet after World War I, aviation insurance. They would start to spread stories about what he was up to. And he in fact was nominated to be the navigator in the England to Australian air race. But when some of the officials heard that he was uh, on the aircraft, they raised an objection and he actually had to move his gear off the aeroplane, off the Blackburn aircraft and he was replaced by Hubert Wilkins who we've talked about here. That was quite upsetting, it took the wind out of his sails and he decided that there wasn't much future in aviation um, in England because of his bad name. So he took off to the USA. He was always broke <clears throat> and he had some family in uh, America and he relied on them to keep him uh, going with uh, ready cash. 
He resorted to being a stunt pilot. At one stage he was employed shooting ducks off a rice uh, field. Um, as a stunt pilot, um, he then progressed to being a stunt man and he extended himself so far that while suspended underneath an aeroplane, uh, it took him 15 minutes to get back up into the aeroplane and that scared the death out of him. <laughs> if the aircraft hadn't run out of fuel or if uh, he had a fallen, it would have been curtains for him. And so he decided to give America away. It was too hard to earn a living there. He came back to Australia. He ran into a friend, Lionel Lee. Lionel Lee worked for Diggers Aviation. It was a country rural aviation organisation that operated out of Wentworth, 100 miles north of Sydney. And uh, he was invited to join the company. So he did, he's very happy to, to move in. His first flight was to take an Avro 504K from Sydney to Wentworth and to stop off um, and do some joy flights on the way. Unfortunately, at the joy flight, uh, base Oberon, he picked the wrong paddock and tipped the, it was a boggy one and he tipped the aircraft over and damaged it. He tried to carry out the repairs himself, he had an engineer or a mechanic on board but they needed to get outside help so they got the local blacksmith to show it with his big hammer and uh, knock a few things back into shape and then <clears throat> they got the local undertaker who had a woodworking shop alongside of his business to come and make a few wooden parts for the aircraft. The next weekend he went to Dubbo for an air show and uh, it was there that he did some aerobatics with a young couple on board, a young freshly engaged couple and uh, he turned on such a performance that one of the spars of the wing cracked and uh, he made uh, a pretty heavy landing. In fact, his male passenger many years later said it was like landing a thousand bricks. Oh. <laughs> he demolished the aircraft and the prop and of course Digger's Aviation weren't too happy with him because he was costing a lot of money. He performed aerobatics over the hospital at Cowra. Um, he was chasing a nurse at the hospital. He was doing aerobatics over the hospital. He was landing and touching down on the main driveway into the hospital. And of course the patients were getting a bit upset about this, though the sick people were quite upset. And then he performed what was regarded as playing dragonfly. And you maybe have come across this where pilots fly along smooth water and brush their wheels on the water. It's quite spectacular if you're outside and pretty frightening if you're inside the aeroplane. But <clears throat> this is uh, where he became very unpopular in Cowra. But he became more unpopular in Cowra where he decided to fly under the bridge. <laughs> there happened to be a team of horses pulling a heavy load <laughs> passing and the horses bolted. The horses struck a sulky which was carrying a, a farmer's pregnant wife. The sulky was tipped over, the lady was tipped out and the baby was born on the side of the road. <laughs> so while all this was taking place, Kingsford Smith, Charles Kingsford Smith, or Chua, as he was known to his mates, uh, was becoming less and less popular and Digger's aviation was going further and further into the ground. Canamble, <coughs> joyriding. On the way to Canamble, six bottles of beer were put on board. The management said, don't put them into Kingsford Smith's aircraft, put them into the other one. And the two aircraft took off in formation. They hadn't gone very far and Smithy landed. <clears throat> so the other aircraft landed on site and said, what's the problem? He said, I'm thirsty, I need a drink. <laughs> they consumed half the beer, took off, went for another 15 minutes, <clears throat> and then he landed again. He said, I, I feel like another drink. So by the time they got to Canamble, um, he was in a, a shocking state. 
And so one of the first tasks he was assigned to do there was to take the mayor for a fly. Mm -hmm. And with a few drinks under his belt, he turned on some aerobatics for the mayor. And of course, the mayor was sick <laughs> over his suit. And of course, when they landed, the official program had to be changed to accommodate the mayor who was wonky on his feet and didn't look too good from a sartorial point of view. That night in the Canamble pub, he had an argument with his mechanic. The mechanic said that he was treating the aircraft too badly. And so they started to brawl. They were kicked out into the street by the publican and the brawl continued in the street. There was so much noise being made that the local sergeant of police who lived nearby got out of bed and over his pyjamas put his blue policeman's tunic, went over the road and arrested the two brawling people. And they were both put in the clink in the lockup and the next day they were fined 10 shillings each. His name was becoming mud. 10 shillings was the fine. Towards the end of the, all this had taken place in nine months, and we're looking at uh, November, and he was assigned to carry two passengers to a christening at Riversley uh, Homestead on the Lachlan River. <clears throat> Instead of landing in a, a wide open paddock, he decided he was going to land in a short paddock uh, alongside the, the homestead, which he did. But he landed so heavily in squeezing the aircraft into the short field that he blew a tire. That didn't uh, hold him up. <clears throat> he enjoyed the champagne uh, throughout the day and then put his two passengers back in the aircraft and attempted to take off with a flat tire. He lost directional control, ended up in some rough territory and then was looking at some tall trees and uh, struck the trees and the aircraft crashed just a little further on. It was a write-off. The insurance company had heard a bit about him and they decided to do some questioning and uh, research and they decided that um, since he'd been drinking with a lot of witnesses uh, covering that, um, he, uh, they, the insurance company didn't pay out on the, um, the accident and that really left diggers with nowhere to go. Uh, the company folded up. It wasn't really only him. The other pilots in the organisation were taking risks and bending aeroplanes as well, but he was doing more than his fair share. So that was the end of Diggers. That's an aircraft, a restored one, which crashed uh, before they even had a, a, which Smithy crashed, before they had a chance to paint a registration on it. Uh, it was brand new and uh, in it went. It has been restored and you can uh, see it in one of the museums over east now. So there's Chiller and his spirits went up. He was out of work, uh, out of money, out of ideas, uh, with a bad name over east. And then there was an ad in the paper, Norman Brearley, that bloke up there, wanted pilots for his new airline and Kingswood Smith was one of the applicants. Really tested the pilots at Point Cook. He tested Charles Kingswood Smith and his comments were that this man is outstanding and he got himself a job. And uh, he lifted his game and came to Western Australia. His life on the West Australian coast doesn't read as bad as what I've just told you, but he certainly caused a lot of stir up and down the Western Australian coast as well. So that was Charles Kingsford Smith before coming to Western Australia. And when you read the books on him, uh, they all say, you know, what a marvellous man he was and what a great pilot he was. But very few books tell you the full story of the man. Right. That book there has all of the details in that I've just mentioned and much, much more. Thank you.